Good evening and welcome to this meeting of Rec Road Baptist Church. I'm grateful that you're here and we look forward to what the Lord has in store for us this evening and we're trusting Him to speak to us from His Word. Uh, let's bow together in a word of prayer and uh, ask the Lord's blessing upon this meeting. As I pray, you pray, and let's trust the Lord has something for us this evening. Let's pray together. Almighty God, I thank Thee for this evening and praise Thee that, Lord, we have been gathered together for such a time as this, that we can come to Thy Word and trust and believe that, Lord, Thy Word doth not return unto Thee void, that Thy Word, Lord, is uh, quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. And we pray, O Lord, Thy Word would penetrate our heart this evening, our cold and oftentimes, Lord, dark heart. We pray that Thou, Lord, discern our thoughts, discern our real intents. And we pray that, Lord, as Thou dost put Thy finger right where, Lord, uh, we are, we pray that we would, Lord, hear the Word, receive it, and obey it. We pray, O God, that Thou wilt find here a people for Thy name's sake. We pray, O Lord, that Thou wilt do a holy uniting amongst our fellowship. For those who are both here at this moment in person, those who watch via live stream, those who attend at different times, O oh Lord, raise up a people here who are united for the same cause, the same desire. Lord, a desire for holiness and faithfulness, a zeal for, Lord, love for Thee, an unwillingness, Lord, to be complacent, but, Father, to be going forward with Thee. O oh Lord, we uh, sing the same hymn. It is our chief complaint that often our love is, is weak and faint. O oh Lord, we pray, may Thou light a holy fire in our own soul, that, Lord, we would burn out for Thee, that we would bring great honor and glory to, our, to Thy name, and, Lord, that, that, that all things in us would die, that Christ might be seen. We pray as a result of this, Lord, may people be saved tonight. May people be saved in the weeks and the months to come. We pray may families be put back together. May lives be gloriously changed. May our country, Lord, may our city be, Lord, turn back to Thee, and may it begin here in this place. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's take our hymn books and we'll stand and sing our, our first hymn this, morning, this evening. Hymn number 329. Hymn number 329. In the misty days of yore, Jesus' precious blood had power in the thief upon the cross to save. Like a bird, his spirit flies to its home in paradise through the power of Calvary's crimson wave. Let's stand and sing hymn 320.
seated. Tonight I'd like to invite you to take your copy of God's Word and we're going to turn to the New Testament book of Revelation. The New Testament book of Revelation tonight. We're going to look at Revelation chapter number 2. Revelation chapter number 2. We're going to begin reading there in verse number 1 of Revelation chapter number 2. Beginning there in verse number 1. And the Word of God says, beginning in verse number 1, Unto the angel of the church of, the, of Ephesus write, These things saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. I know thy works and thy labor and thy patience, and how thou canst not bear them which are evil, and thou hast tried them which say they are apostles and are not, and hast found them liars, and hast borne and hast patience for my name's sake, and hast labored and hast not fainted. Nevertheless, I have something, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. Remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen, and repent, and do the first works, or else I will come unto thee quickly and remove thy candlestick out of his place, except thou repent. But this hast thou, that thou hatest the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He that hath an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit saith to the churches, to him that overcometh will I give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. And we'll stop our reading just there, and we'll ask the Lord to add His blessing to the reading of His Word. Hold your place there, and we're going to come back to that portion of Scripture here in just a few moments. But let's take our hymn books once more. Let's stand and sing another hymn, I Have a Shepherd, hymn number 457. I have a shepherd, one I know so well, how he has blessed me, tongue can never tell. On the cross he suffered, shed his blood and died, that I might ever in his love confide. We'll stand and sing hymn 457.
this evening, I'd like to draw your attention just to a few notices that we have. If you need a notice sheet, there are some at the back. You're welcome to grab them. They're there on the sound table. And uh, I hope you'll take these home with you and uh, pray over these different things. We try to update it and keep it as relevant as possible, and that way we can pray for one another. Um, but what a blessing to be here tonight. Uh, we have several things we're praying for. I want to say we had a blessed prayer meeting. We've been having a prayer meeting at 5.15 before the evening meeting now for some weeks. And the Lord's been meeting with us and answering prayer, even in the meeting. And so we give God the glory uh, for that. And I hope if you're ever able to, to come and join us at 5.15 before the service. And let's pray and ask the Lord to continue to work in our church. Um, let's continue to pray for uh, various different things that are, are going on. Uh, we want to continue to remember uh, Pat's friend, Wynn, and his family, who's in urgent need of prayer, and continue to pray for Wynn. And if you want any more details about that, I'm sure Pat would be uh, willing to speak to you about it after the service. Um, continue to pray as well for the Bosco family and the visa situation with their children. And I've not heard if there's been any change in that, um, but continue to pray for Marie and John and ask the Lord to really make a way for uh, their children and their family to be reunited. Um, let's uh, give God the glory for so much work that's been done in the ministry hall. And uh, we're on the last bit of plastering now and, and soon... God willing, we're going to be working towards getting paint on the walls and uh, going towards some of the architrave and the um, skirting board and various different things. So we're looking forward to that. And please keep that in prayer. And people have asked me about different work days. We're working on those things, but I, the Lord has dealt with me about spending all of my time over there. It's very easy uh, to want to be able to spend all your time getting things going and making it go forward. But there are other things that have to be done as well. And so I'm praying about it, and we're going to be going forward together. And don't worry, there will be more work days. Uh, we are specifically um, going to be doing some work days soon um, on the bottom half of the ministry hall. Uh, during the summer months, while we're not having anything on, the mums and tots in the English classes, we need to strip the floor and, uh, and level it and then lay down some uh, new carpet so that we can begin to have mums and tots, our creche, um, can move next door and it will give children a bit more room to run and be free and also you won't hear them so that will be a blessing to many um, and so and I'm sure the crash workers would be very grateful for that so we're going to be working that way and then also in September Jenny and Philip are going to be getting married and they have asked specifically they're going to be it's our first wedding here at the church uh, since it's reopened and then also um, our first reception at the ministry hall they want to have it there and so uh, we've got a bit of work to do before that can happen. Maybe a rat or two that we need to remove as well. So let's ask the Lord to help us. And uh, if you're able to on those days to come and help, a lot of that work is going to be sort of the destruction and filling in holes and maybe doing some painting. Um, it's going to be a, a good time. And so plan to be there and, and come with us when you can. Uh, we have changed a few things on the calendar just to make note of. We were due to have a church family pic picnic on Saturday, July 9th. We've changed that to a church-wide visitation day. And uh, we've had several church meals here recently, and uh, I feel that, that really the, the most profitable thing would be to go out and knock doors and speak to people. And so if you're able to come, um, we're going to be doing that, of course, every Saturday from 10 to half 12. You're welcome to come. And then this Tuesday night, we're going to begin. Um, when we go out on the doors and knock doors and speak to people, uh, we always pray that God gives us prospects or good conversations, people that are willing for us to come back and speak to them. And through that, we've seen uh, many people come. Margaret Stokes, who's now with the Lord, uh, we knocked on her door uh, five, five and a half years ago. And she came to the Lord and uh, was a, got a wonderful Christian testimony. And every, nearly every Sunday school child, some that are in here tonight, I knocked on their family's door, uh, or someone did at some point, and we went and we visited them, um, or they moved into a house where we previously knocked the door. And they started coming to Sunday school. And so uh, we have about 40 or 50 testimonies of the fact that door knocking works. But one of the things that's important is that we follow up. So a lot of times these prospect cards are generated. And then it's overwhelming for just one person to go and visit. We need multiple people. And so you would get a card if you came to help. You'd get a card that had the name of the person. It'd have the conversation, a bit about what happened. And it'd just be another follow-up to try to encourage them. Perhaps it might be to share the gospel. It might be to invite them, to encourage them to come out to work, to, sorry, to the church. It might be to pray with them, whatever it might be. Um, but if you're willing to do that, we're going to meet here at 530 to pray, and then we're going to try to go out around 6 o'clock. 
and uh, would love to have any help that would like to come. I'll be here, and if you're able to do that, that would be a real blessing. That'll be on Tuesday, and we'll try to do that for future Tuesdays going forward as well. Um, next Sunday, please be in prayer. Uh, it is the baptism for Jacob, and uh, Jacob has uh, come to know the Lord, and we've met several times and wants to follow the Lord in believer's baptism. And uh, we have spoken about it and are encouraged by it. And so I hope you'll plan to be here. Encourage him and be at the service. He'll share his Christian testimony and then be going through the waters of baptism here just below me. And it's going to be a great day. So please pray for Jacob and encourage him and uh, ask the Lord to use him. God's been working in his life and we want to continue to pray. Um, it's been good. Uh, my, uh, many of you know my, in, my in-laws are here. Uh, my father-in-law is just here on the left. He's a pastor, Pastor Mark Manning. And... Um, he, he's taken two weeks away from his church, so do pray for the Fellowship Baptist Church in Roanoke, Virginia, that the Lord will be with them as he's away. And pray for my mother-in-law, uh, Brenda, and then also for my sister-in-law, Grace, who's come over as well. They've gone back home today, just feeling a little bit unwell, probably still some of the travel sickness. And of course, Sunday's here. The full day is a very big day for anybody. Whether you're, uh, if you're a five-star athlete, it's difficult and you come out tired. So um, we're praying for them and asking the Lord to help them. And Wesley and Wyatt are over the moon that they're here and enjoying every bit of it. So we praise God for that. Thank you for all those who've been praying. And um, just some, some other things. I keep Rosie in your prayers. She's going on holiday this, uh, this week. And uh, she wouldn't want me to mention that, but Sheila mentioned it this morning. And so pray for her. I think she's landed on a place. Her and Carla are going away. And pray that God would give her a restful time. You may want to help her as she goes out on holiday and encourage her along the way. And so please do that if you're able to and encourage her and pray for her. And uh, that would be wonderful. Uh, let's keep Camp Victory. The Camp Victory car wash is coming up this Saturday. We're going to have two stations of car wash. So there'll be, we'll have two, God willing, if you have a pressure washer that might be available, uh, that would be wonderful. We have one. We'll need another one. Um, and then we'll have, of course, loads of sponges, soap, and hopefully several teenagers there to help scrub it down. We always need adults there to help, not necessarily do the, bl the brunt of the work. We want the teenagers to work, but to make sure that they don't throw the sponge down on the pavement, get a few rocks in it, and then go to scrub a car. And here we were thinking that we were going to make money for camp, and all we're now paying is for somebody's paint job because we messed it up. So if you're able to come and help, you might help in the bake sale. Um, there will be food. We'll have refreshments and things like that. It'll be a wonderful day of fellowship. We're going to try to use the, the church hall, car, the ministry hall car park. And so uh, please be able to, please plan to, to come over and help us if you can. This week, I'll be trying to clear out that car park. If anybody would like to come over and help, I'll, try, I'll put out a, a, a time on the church WhatsApp group, uh, just trying to get it ready for the, for the uh, car wash. There are a lot of things going on and a lot of things to pray about. Uh, if I were to sit here and go through them all, we, we wouldn't have time for a Bible message. I hope you'll take this, pray over it, and plan to be here. We put these dates on here um, to encourage you to come. The Lord is blessing and helping and meeting all of our needs. We're nearly at the 20,000 pound mark for our initial payment on the loan. We're only about 3,500 pounds away. And so please ask the Lord to, to help bring that in. And um, we're trusting Him to meet all of our provisions and needs. Pray for our missionaries. And uh, let's, ask, let's go forward together with the Lord. We're not going to take up an offering tonight. If you do want to give, uh, please feel free to give after the service. If you're going to give to missions, you can give here in the box. Or if you're going to give to um, the building fund, you can put it here in the box as well. It helps us designate it and know where to go. But let's continue to keep one another in prayer. And I'd like to ask Eddie, if you wouldn't mind, uh, if you could stand where you are, Eddie, and take these different requests and the offering uh, to the Lord in prayer. Thank you. 
Would that help for the Lord? Do you, do you pray you would keep them all fit and well? Yes. Uh, not soon, uh, they will all be delivered. Or, or the children will be pray all fit and healthy. Amen. We want to answer The Lord will pray for John and Marie, as Father for the family's Jesus to come through soon. Amen. And they'll be able to come back to this country. We'll be with their family. Very soon we'll be free. Pray for um, Paul and Danielle. Pray for all the, uh, the purchase of the new house, Lord. Uh, all that will be finalized soon, Lord. And mm. They go to New York School. Amen. Bless them. And uh, we pray for those who are looking to sell their homes and move to the building. Pray your blessing for them. So, yes. So, dear Lord, we thank you, Lord. For all you're doing, Lord, thank you for all your provision. Thank you, Lord, for all the money that's coming not to pay for the pay in the loan off, Lord. And I know, Lord, that you own the cattle on a thousand hills, Lord, and all the beasts, the forest of yours, and all the gold, so is mine. So, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. and we will not lack, and have not lack yes. any good things. So we bless you, Lord. All your blessings towards us, and we pray for our pastor tonight, and bless your word to him to us. Help it to stick in our hearts, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Well, uh, just before the Bible message, we'll uh, have another hymn. Hymn number 396. Hymn number 396, Jesus keep me near the cross, there a precious fountain. Free to all, a healing stream flows from Calvary's mountain. Let's stand and sing this wonderful hymn, hymn number 396. Oh 
Tonight, I'd like to invite you to turn back with me to the book of Revelation, the book of Revelation, and we'll look at Revelation chapter number 2. Revelation chapter number 2. As we come to the book of Revelation, we find there in the first few chapters, the Lord is dealing specifically with uh, real live churches there in the book of Revelation through the Apostle John. And He has a message for each and every one of them. Tonight we're going to be looking at the church at Ephesus. And uh, really, the Lord has sort of brought me to this passage and over the last little while. And I hope tonight it will be a help and a blessing to you. As we come here, it's not only, I, I believe really you have really two pictures here. You have legitimate churches that are living in the time frame in which the book of Revelation is written. Perhaps some believe around 40 years or 50 years from when the church at Ephesus had first started and uh, the Apostle Paul, of course, had ministered there. And uh, now, uh, through the Apostle John, the Lord has a message for this church. Not only is it a picture as we deal with these different churches, these seven churches that are mentioned here in the book of Revelation, it is not only for that specific time and what that individual church was uh, going through, but I think also a picture of the church age in which we live. And these spirits, that, these situations that are in these various different churches are, can be found in our church as well. And so the message is relevant for us this evening. If you were to sum up this sort of passage of Ephes, uh, with a, the message to the church at Ephesus um, that the Lord had, most people know it by this one phrase. And he says, it's this one phrase is, is found here in this passage in verse number four. Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first Love. I want you to notice that phrase there. Thou hast left thy first love. The Lord here is speaking. He's speaking to a church. He's speaking through the Apostle John and He's speaking to a group of believers at the church of Ephesus. And as you look at this church, this is a church that's very hard to pick something out that's wrong with it. By perhaps every standard, they are doing just about everything that is right. They would be a church today that if we just didn't go to verse 4, and we just stuck with the first three verses, we would want to be a part of that church. They are really going forward, it seems like, for the Lord. But yet the Lord hones in on something that is important and is found all throughout the Scripture. That you can have absolutely everything in line in your life. You can have absolutely everything in line with your ministry, with your Christian walk. You can have almost everything in line. But if you're lacking just this one thing, you're missing it all. I think he says it best in 1 Corinthians 13. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not charity or love, I am become a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains and have not charity or love, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned and have not charity or love, it profiteth me nothing. Charity suffereth long. It is kind. Charity envieth not. Charity vaunteth not itself, is not puffed up, doth not behave itself unseemly, seeketh not her own, is not evilly easily provoked, thinketh no evil. Rejoiceth not in iniquity, but rejoiceth in truth. Beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all things. Charity never faileth. But whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. 
Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. But when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. When I was a child, I spake as a child, I understood as a child, I thought as a child, but when I became a man, I put away childish things. For now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I shall know, even as also I am known. And now abideth faith, hope, charity, these three. But the greatest of these is charity. That wonderful passage that you hear quoted so often echoes here in Revelation chapter 2 in the first few verses. Because you find a church that had nearly everything right, but they were missing just one thing they had left. Their first love. As we look at Revelation chapter number 2 tonight, we're going to look at it in a few different ways. We see first there is a commendation. In other words, there are things in which the Lord says about this church that are good. There is a condemnation. There is something the Lord points out that is bad. And then there is a recommendation or a call, you could say, to repent in order to continue in the Lord's work. Notice with me tonight as we look at this passage, I want you to notice with me first the commendation. Let's look at the church at Ephesus. It says, unto the angel of the church at Ephesus. We can see here, and we know according to different Bible passages, that the term angel doesn't just mean the celestial being, but it means messenger. And so therefore we have no need to believe it's not continue, It's not found in the rest of Scripture that an angel is pastoring a church. I don't believe an angel is necessarily assigned to a church. This is speaking to the pastor at the church at Ephesus. So unto the angel at the church of Ephesus write, These things saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. He's talking here as the Lord examining these seven churches examining these seven pastors, examining these seven works of God. He has a message for them. The Lord is speaking. He has a word for them. And notice what He says first, I know thy works. The Greek word there is a word that designates action. Imagine the Lord saying to you, I know your works. It's saying, in essence, about this church that this was a very active, working, laboring church. They were through and through for the Lord. They were going forward. They were evangelistic. They were, if they were in modern times, if they were probably here in the city of Liverpool, they would be driving buses. They would be bringing people in to the services. They'd be in the city center preaching the word. They'd be knocking on doors. They'd be doing all sorts of things. They were a very active church. And perhaps even, you could say that even perhaps those who were in the midst, it wasn't just the pastor that was doing it. There was an active congregation there that was working and that was laboring. And the Lord says, I know thy works. What a wonderful thought. The Lord can know your works. He can know exactly what you're about. He sees everything that you're going through. And He examines our church. And I wonder today, if the Lord says, I know your works to our church, Brock Road Baptist Church, here in Liverpool, England, would the Lord say that our church is an active church? Perhaps you might say, well, there are a few, there are things that are busy. The pastor always looks very tired. Does that mean mean they're active? It's not just a ministerial activeness, it was a congregational activeness. They were a church. Think about the city of Ephesus. The city of Ephesus was a unique city. It was a port city, much like us. It was a port city for most of, the, most of Asia. And if you'll remember, this church, when it was started there, the Apostle Paul was the one who founded the church. Of course, it was a work of the Lord Jesus. The Lord used the Apostle Paul to go. And through the preaching of the Word, 
amazing things began to happen in Ephesus. It was steeped in pagan idolatry. They worshipped the goddess Diana, which was actually a very ugly goddess. It wasn't a big, beautiful statue of perhaps a Hollywood figure we might imagine. It was a very ugly-looking creature, a god of fertility, and they had all sorts of immorality that was involved in the worship of the goddess Diana. And as Paul came to the city and he began to preach the gospel, people were responding to the word and being gloriously saved. So much so that the entire city was eventually sent into an uproar. People began to take their books and their witchcraft and their idolatry and all of their little idols and they began to burn them. They began to, to burn them so much so that they even, took a, they even took account of how much money was actually burned up. It was amazing. And it was affecting the whole city. The Apostle Paul had labored there. Aquila and Priscilla had labored there. The great Old Testament preacher Apollos had labored there. Wonderful things were taking place in the city of Ephesus. I mean, you talk about a church that had unbelievable influence. They, out of this church, you'll remember that out of this church, through the preaching of the Apostle Paul, other churches in Asia were established and strengthened and encouraged. This would have been modern-day Turkey. And God was moving in Ephesus. This was an amazing thing. A church where they had seen the hand of God in such a miraculous way. And God says here, I know thy works. Perhaps he's thinking from the beginning to where they are now. What an amazing thing has taken place. And I think even greater, a generation perhaps had died off. It, now at the time of which, this, uh, which the, the book of Revelation is written, uh, some estimate could have been 40, 50, 60 years since the church was first, found, first founded. No doubt though some of those founding members would have passed away by then and you would have had a new generation that was there and in the midst of it and the work is still continuing. And so... It's quite an amazing thing to see it going forward. Not only that, we see, not only does he say, I know thy works, he says, and thy labor. The word labor here differs from the word works that were previously before it because the word labor goes even a step further. The word labor insinuates a work, a work for God that comes at a cost. So it's not just that they are active, but there are also those in the midst that are sacrificing. There are those who are laboring, and it is costing them something. It might be costing them something in their pockets. It might be costing them something in their time and with their family. It might be costing them something, missing various things that they enjoy in order that they might be involved in the Lord's work. And so we see here, the Lord is commending these things. These are good things. He's saying, I know thy works. I, I know thy labor. That some of you are going beyond. That some of you are and you're serving at a cost. You're giving up in order that the work of God might go forward. You're going without in order that God might be glorified. Some people to say, well, no, 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 what, what needs to happen is in order for the work to really be strengthened, we just need to settle down a bit. We need to take a little more time for holiness. We need to take a little more time for purity. Can I tell you what they're really saying is, I'd like to spend a little bit more time at home uh, watching television before a service. I'd really like to have a little bit more time uh, relaxing a bit. And, and it's not for holiness, really. It's just because it's just too much for them. And, and they don't want to be as active no, no, no. Uh, we see here the, the call to holiness is never to be set apart and to take away. It's to labor at a cost. Serving the Lord costs you something. The Bible we hold in our hands that we read today in our own English language costs many people something. They hated John Wycliffe. You heard, heard the illustration. If you went to Carlisle, they hated John Wycliffe so much because he taught men uh, the Word of God and he tra was, was active in translating the Scriptures and the Roman Catholic Church couldn't kill him uh, while he was alive. And so they decided they'd find out where, after he had died, they found out where he was buried and they hated him so much they dug up his bones and they burned him. Why? 
because he gave his life for translating the Word of God and getting it into the English people's hands. And it could go on and on and on. There's a, the, 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 lands, the, the country in which we're in, our, our lands are, are, are full of blood of martyrs who gave themselves for the faith, serving the Lord cost. It's not just those who have given their lives, but those who have also given their time and their effort in teaching Sunday school. Those who have given time and effort in service of, you, we could say it even in our uh, 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 application to our church, driving minibuses, working with those who are poor and destitute, going into some of the darkest places that nobody else wanted to go, and yet the Lord did some of His greatest works there. I'm reading currently a biography of George Mueller, and how he started the orphanages there in Bristol, England. It wasn't English, George Mueller, he was German. And yet the Lord used them here in this country. Perhaps English was his second, was I think his second language or his third. And yet the Lord used them in a wonderful way. It cost him something. It cost a lot. Yet he dealt with a group of people that nobody at the time was caring about. Robert Rakes, a, a wealthy man, owned a, 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 a nice newspaper, was, was looking out on the young people of his day and the working class and child labor laws. There were no child labor laws and you had young people that were working in the factories, children. They were learning the mouth of the factory workers. They were learning all of the nasty things that were going on. Sundays were their only days off and they would run amok and he thought somebody must do something and here's a man who came down out of his wealth and out of his prosperity and he said, I'm going to do something. And he started something, a Sabbath school or a Sunday school. And he began to take time to teach children from the Word of God how to read, how to write, the truths of Scripture. And out of it birthed a wonderful movement that swept across the country where you can very rarely go and find people of a generation past that didn't grow up going to Sunday school. Why? Because laboring cost him something. Here we have it. Some, the Lord is saying here, I know thy works and thy labor. The Lord is saying this is good. It's good, the, the work and the labor. He goes on to say, and thy patience. Not only I know thy works and thy labor, but thy patience. Thy patience. This is not a passive patience. This is a triumphant patience. This is not just enduring trials and tribulations and just holding on and praying and hoping that we're going to make it. It's enduring trial and tribulation and being triumphant in it and going forward and seeing the Lord work in a miraculous way. And he says here, I know thy patience. I know thy patience. In other words, you could say it this way, thy endurance. In other words, you're persistent. You're not willing to quit. You just carry on and you just persevere and, and you're not able to be turned aside. I was reading in preparation and studying for the, the sermon tonight and I came across a story about a man. He said he had uh, two, he, he, he was noticing a bulldog that was, looked rough and tough, an English bulldog, and it was coming down the alleyway and came into his back garden. He had two setters there, and I think I'm saying the word right, two big dogs, bird dogs, setters. And he said the bulldog decided it'd get back into the yard where the setters were. And he thought, well, at first he was going to stop the bulldog, and then he thought, well, those setters will sort them out, and, and he'll eventually go away. And he said, sure enough, the bulldog got down into the yard, and the setters came, and they all had to go, and the bulldog ran round and round, and finally got tired, and went out of the, went out of the, the garden, and and walked back down the alleyway and he came out and he spent the rest of the day licking his sores. He was worn out and tired. And he thought, that'll teach that dog a lesson. He said, sure enough, the next day, here comes that mean, nasty looking bulldog walking down the alley right to that back garden. And what does he do? He gets down into the back garden. And there are the setters again and they have a go again. And they're running around the garden and those setters are getting the best of the bulldog. And before you know it, the, the bulldog comes out again. He's wore out after the day, and he looks over, and he spends the rest of the day licking his wounds. He's been beat up. And the guy thought, surely, that'll be enough for that bulldog. And the third day. And the third day comes, and here comes the bulldog again, down the alleyway. 
And sure enough, he goes into the back garden, and again, he goes around with those two big, massive dogs, the centers, and they have a go, and they, they go around the garden, and worn out, and the bulldog comes out and spends the rest of the day licking his wounds. The man said he had to go away for three weeks, and he, was, he thought, surely these, this, this bulldog will eventually go away. And he came back, and he came home, and he spoke to his wife after being gone for three weeks, and he said, whatever happened to that bulldog? And she said, it's, it's, it's unbelievable. She said, that bulldog never stopped coming. And now, when he goes into the back garden, the setters just whine, and they run away because they don't want to be in the fight with the bulldog. What am I trying to say? Persistence, tenacity, not quitting, enduring, suffering, being triumphant. And there is something about being persistent and consistent. It wins every time. Every time without fail. And that's what this church, what, what the Lord used to describe this church, was that they were tenacious. They were going forward. They wouldn't quit. No matter how, how difficult, no matter how hard, they just kept pressing forward. And so the Lord says, I know thy works, thy labor, and thy patience. Enduring, continuing, and pressing forward. He goes on to say even more, And how thou canst not bear them which are evil. And how thou canst not bear them which are evil. Notice here, not only were they active church, not only were they persevering, but they were also a discerning church, or you could say it's sensitive. They were sensitive to evil in the midst of their fellowship. It wasn't that they allowed and just continued to allow evil to persevere and, and, and grow in their fellowship. They were sensitive to it, and the Bible says, and you cannot bear them which are evil. In other words, you had no time for evil to even dwell in the midst of your fellowship. No time. You were sensitive to it. You wouldn't entertain it for even just a moment. You were sensitive to evil. And so it says here that this church was, you say, why were they sensitive? For holiness. The Lord is commending them here. And they had a real zeal for holiness. As you look at this church, you can see just about everything is right. Who wouldn't want to be a part of this? This seems amazing. What God is doing here at this place in such a pagan city, a city so steeped in idolatry, so given to immortality, you now have a fellowship of people that won't entertain immorality for a moment. They won't even be a part of it. He cannot bear them which are evil. And not only that, they were discerning. They didn't just swallow hook, line, and sinker what everybody said. You know in those days, and you'll remember as you read the epistles, there were all sorts of people claiming to be apostles. False teachers who came in seeking to draw men to themselves, not draw men to Christ. Seeking to have those who would sit at their feet and gain attention and, 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 and gain influence over people and cause the church to go astray. And the Bible says of this church at Ephesus, Thou hast tried them which say they are apostles and are not, and hast found them liars. What a wonderful thing. This was a discerning group of people. They... they they were discerning. They, they didn't just swallow everything. They were not easily influenced. Apparently the labor of the Apostle Paul, the labor of Apollos, the labor later on of Timothy, of the Apostle John, all you could say all of the heavy hitters that were there were at Ephesus had had some sort of influence. And the Lord was blessing and working. And this was a church that had a real zeal for the truth and the gospel. And they had all these things going for them. It says, go on in verse number 3, and has borne, and has patience, and for my name's sake has labored, and notice this, has not fainted. Has not fainted. Continued. We reminded of that verse of the Apostle Paul in Galatians 6, 9, Grow not weary in well-doing, for in due season you shall reap if you faint not. And so we have here a church that is doing all of the right things. 
And you say, well, what happened? The sad thing is, and the truth and the reality, not just in a church, but in the life of a Christian, is that you can have all of these things in order, and if you have lost your first love, you say, what is your first love? The Lord Jesus, who you do all these things for. That in all things, He might have the preeminence in your life, we love Him. Why? Because He first loved us. Our motive, Paul said, that the love of Christ constrains me. But it is possible to have absolutely everything in order and still not have your love right. And it's all in vain. And God says, I know your works. I see you. I see everything that you're doing. But you've lost your first love. What was it like when you first came to the Lord? I bet you couldn't be kept out of the church service. I bet you couldn't stop from reading your Bible. I bet you were zealous to tell others about Christ. I bet you were, you were overwhelmed that the fact that God in His grace and mercy would save you. And the love was just radiating in your heart. You're overwhelmed as often new believers are. It's a wonderful thing. It's always encouraging as Jacob will come up on Sunday and he shares his testimony. It's always wonderful to hear the testimony of new believers, not just for the sake of the lost, but also for the sake of the saved, so that we're reminded of that first love. The reason why we labor. The reason why we won't quit. The reason why we endure is not so that we can get some sort of sticker and pat on the back and maybe somebody will write something nice about us one day. No, 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 no. It's all for Christ. But somewhere along the line, things began to get mechanical. Somewhere along the line, and I don't know where it is, but you do. And if you don't know where it is, God by His Spirit does. And may God help you and I to ask Him, where did it fall away? Where did it just, where did I lose it? Where, where did I allow my first love just to drop? Where did, where, what happened? Where did I get so mechanical in my Christian life? Where did I get so nonchalant with my, my walk with the Lord? Where, where did I allow things to begin to slip to where it doesn't bother me now to be away? It doesn't bother me now not to pray like I used to, to miss the services, to be in my Bible. It doesn't bother me as much anymore. I'm not too bothered anymore. What happened? The Lord says, you've lost your first love. And the thing is tonight, and for me as well, you can't go into my life and show me what happened and where it was. I have to do that. And the Lord does it by His Spirit. You say, why is it so important? I mean, I'm doing all the right things. I'm, I'm, I'm ticking all the boxes. I mean, sure, I'm not, as, I'm not what, I, what I once was, but I'm, I'm not out doing horrible things. I'm, I'm not terrible. And neither was the church at Ephesus. They weren't horrible. They were doing things that were right. Surely that's enough. But look, when the Lord draws His attention to something in your life, it's important. When he says, nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, then may God help us to take notice of what he's saying. Because thou hast left thy first love. He says in verse number 5, Remember therefore, whence thou art fallen. How is my first love recovered? Stop and think. And ask the Lord to put His finger on it in your heart and life. Where did I begin to go astray? Where did I allow my love to grow dim? Where did the fire begin to wane and wax lower and lower? Where was it? Do you know something? The Lord is always good about bringing those things back to your memory. You may have a memory that falters and you may forget all sorts of things. But don't you know, we have an all-knowing God and He is able to bring to your heart back. And the Lord says here, Remember therefore thou art fallen. And notice here, not only remember, but repent. 
repent. Tell the Lord that you're sorry. 1 John tells us that if we confess our sin, He is faithful and just to forgive us of our sin. What a wonderful promise. As I looked at this passage and I examined my own life, I was reminded of areas where I had allowed things to slip. And I'm grateful that in the midst of my own faults and failures, I can claim that promise that if I confess my sin, He is faithful and just to forgive me of my sin and cleanse me of all my unrighteousness. The Bible says here, I will come unto thee quickly. And I will remove, he says, sorry, in verse number five, repent and do the first works or else. You say, why is it so important? Here's why it's so important. Because if we do not repent, the Lord will remove our candlestick out of the place. He's speaking here to the church. But however much more, it's as applicable to you and me. He was warning the church at Ephesus that if this one issue is not dealt with, that the Lord was going to remove that candlestick, remove that church. And the sad thing today is that you can go to Ephesus and there is no remnant of the church that was once there. The warning was given, you have lost your first love, but the light was soon taken away. And it was moved somewhere else. He says... How can you avoid this except thou repent? Tonight, this is a message, of course, as we look at it. He's speaking to the church, but I want to take it a step further and make it applicable into your own life. Can I ask you this question? Have you lost your first love with the Lord? You may have things on the right on the outside, but you know that on the inside, you're not what you used to be. I'm saying this to you tonight because not only does it speak to you, it speaks to me. The Lord's dealt with me about these things. And may God help us. Except we restore that first love and return to those first works, the Lord may remove us. And that's the reality. The Bible says here, except thou repent. You say, why should I repent? Because there are many around who have never heard. There's still many that don't know the first love because nobody's ever told them about Christ. And may God help us to make those things right. I don't, want, I don't want my life, my light that the Lord has given me to go out before the Lord is absolutely done. And I hope that that's the same for you. I don't want my influence in the life of my children and my family and, and in the little influence the Lord gives us here and in this place to go out before it's time. And we have to remember to keep that first love. And if you've lost it, get on your knees tonight and pray and ask God to restore it before it's too late. Confess it all to the Lord. Ask Him, please, Restore my first love that I might still be used for thee. Will you bow with me in a word of prayer? Almighty God, we praise thee tonight for thy word, and we pray that thou would please apply it to our hearts. Oh Lord, tonight thou art good. How wonderful it is to know that first love, the love of the Lord Jesus, the Lord who saved a wretch like us. We once were lost, but now we're found, was blind, but now we see. Oh, the love that bought me and brought me into the fold. How wonderful it is, Lord, to know Thee and to love Thee. But, Father, how easy it is as we grow in our Christian walk, as we continue with the monotony of the day and of the weeks and of the years to come, Lord, to allow our love to grow weak and faint, to allow our first love, Lord, to slip through our fingers and the Christian life become a mere mechanic rather than a relationship. Oh, Lord, please help us restore that first love. I pray in my life tonight, in the life of our church, in the life of those here listening and online, oh, Lord, please help us, we pray, to know thy first love. In Jesus' name we pray, for his sake. Amen. Amen. If you take your hymn book, we'll stand and sing our closing hymn tonight.
in 543. Living for Jesus, a life that is true, striving to please Him in all that I do, yielding allegiance, glad-hearted and free, this is the pathway of blessing to me. O oh, Jesus, Lord and Savior, I give myself to Thee. Let's stand and sing in 543. house and uh, we are going to have tea and fellowship and biscuits just afterwards if you'd like to stick around and have a bit of fellowship but uh, if the Lord has dealt with you in any way I'll be at the back would love to speak to you and uh, let's pray for one another remember Tuesday night at half five if you want to be a part of visitation um, and also uh, Wednesday night prayer meeting at 7 15 I hope you can be there but I'd like to ask my father-in-law if he wouldn't mind uh, Pastor Mark Manning to close us in a word of prayer our Father, we're so thankful for your word. We've heard it so clearly tonight. 
And Lord, we ask you to help us to love you like we should. You first loved us, and we're so thankful for the love you demonstrated at Calvary. And Lord, we ask you to help us this week to, to read your word and to walk with you and to fellowship with you, and we'd be renewed and refreshed by your spirit. Mm -hmm. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.